expanses of time? Like, are you better if someone says, I need something in a day, in an hour, or do you write with kind of, do you write well with big expanses? Um, I, it depends what it is. If it's, if it's for songwriting, I never really have deadlines for songwriting. So I'll just write, um, sometimes I just get in the mood to write and I, that's when I write songs for prose, which I'm focusing a lot on now. I, it definitely helps to have a deadline. I, I enrolled in, a uh, a class this year so that I would be sure to keep writing because I do want to do a collection of short stories and my book has a soundtrack to it because I was very interested in the intersection of storytelling between songs and prose and um, I love the process of writing songs that went along with the book so it's just a, a, a field that I not a field but it's a it's an endeavor that I don't see a lot of people doing. And so, and it interests me a lot. So my next goal is probably to do a collection of literary short stories with accompanying soundtrack to each story has a, a track that, that, that kind of explores the theme of that story. Um, so when it comes to writing prose, yes, a deadline helps. Was I gonna sit down and write my collection of short stories? Without that, I don't know. So I just, I was really concerned that I kept writing. So I took a, a writing class and I actually graduate with my first degree in uh, fine arts and English in May. So I'm thinking if I can get it together, I don't know if I can because a, the, a lot of the deadlines for MFA programs are December 1st and I have so much to do for the end of this semester. But there's one school nearby that has a January deadline that I'm thinking of just going right into an MFA program because my main concern is that I keep writing and that I keep improving as a writer. And I still think that for me, one of the best ways to do that is in a, a structured way where I, where I have an assignment and also it pushes me. The class I'm doing now has really pushed me out of, out of my... Um, um, comfort zone as a writer. Do you think it's important to write every day and in some fashion? I mean, I think songwriters and writers in general fall into two camps. Don't push it. So write when things come to you. Others say, no, you've got to do it every day to stay consistent, to stay disciplined. Um, yes and no. I, do, I, I mean, theoretically, I think it's best to do it every day. I think anything you want to be good at, the more you do it, the better you're going to be at it. Do I do that? No, I don't. But I do know, like, if I have no ideas, like if I'm given something and I've, I I, don't get the ideas walking around waiting for them to to pop into my head. I mean, that happens sometimes with songs or something, you know, little flashes. But when I, as far as the actual meat of a, of a piece, it only comes if I'm actually writing, you know. And sometimes I found if I just sit down and write, that it will come to me, you know, the ideas will come, the topics will come, the themes will come. So the more, you know, if, if I'm not doing that, it's just all kind of in the sky, in the ether, you know, hoping that everything converges where I'm in the mood and I have a great idea and there's nothing to do. And, and that's just life is like, you know, sometimes if you want to get some work done, you just do have to sit down. So yeah, I don't do it, but I think that's how you should do it. I, I, I do feel like that tends to be, you know, and I read interviews with writers in the Paris Review and they talk about how, yeah, I mean, you can't wait for that perfect moment where you say, oh, the time is right. You've just got to sit down and kind of get through all the, I mean, songwriters have told me this, you got to get through all the crap, right? Before you can get to the good stuff, you could just can't necessarily start you know, with the good stuff, right? Absolutely. That's what I think. I mean, I tell writers, um, songwriters, you know, for every really good song, really good song I've written, I've probably written maybe five that are good, but they're not really good. Like if it's not a good song, I'm not going to write, I'm not going to finish it. If, if, yeah. if, if I'm not, if I'm not feeling fired up and excited about a song or you know, and even a story or, or a, a, an essay or something, you know, sometimes it's just powering through knowing that, that they're not all going to be great. They're not all going to be great. Now, some of them can get to great, 
um, you know, with time and going back. But with a song, it can get a little like, uh, maybe this just isn't a great song. Maybe it's just a good song, which is fine. A good song's fine. But you do have to write, you have to write the, the I don't want to say mediocre because I don't even, I'll stop even at new, mediocre. I'll just stop. I don't, I don't want to do mediocre stuff. And I'm not saying by pleasing everyone, I mean by my standards, you know, my standards of mediocrity, my standard of good, my standard of really good. So that's, that's who I'm aiming for. And I know, you know, I know when it's, and, but yeah, with stories, I think you just learn something, stories and essays, and you can shape an essay, you know, you can shape a, a story or an essay and make it, unless it's just a, a dog of an idea, you know, in which case, you know, I've never experienced that, but I've heard of writers like spending two years on something and then going, this is just not good. <laughs> I've heard songwriters tell me, even songwriters, five, six, seven years, they've got these ideas. So do you, I guess those mediocre ideas that you discard, do you ever come back to them? Absolutely. Them again? I, I think of songs as real estate. I think of them as little properties and some of them are fixer uppers and some of them are going to increase in value over time. And some of them, you know, need to be remodeled and some of them need to be torn down and deconstructed and maybe you just keep the foundation. So I know it's a weird analogy, but for me, it really, really works. And I actually have, I mean, I probably have about 2000 voice memos on my phone that every now and then just go back, I'll just pick a month like, okay, what do I have from 2014? And I'll just listen to all the little snippets, little snippets. It might be me on a, with a guitar playing something cool, or it might be me in my car humming a melody or a, a line that I thought was good that I'm just repeating just to kind of remember it. So, and I'll go, oh, wow. So I keep all that. But before I had voice memos, thank goodness, that makes it a lot easier. I have, I still have to this day, you know, cratefuls of spiral notebooks that hold I mean, I mean, going back to the beginning, I mean, I don't think I would go back and, and use ideas. Um, I mean, I, I kind of have enough trust and faith in myself to generate new stuff. So I don't really do that very often. But every now and then, I'll kind of go through and just see what's there and remember things. And the most fun is finding songs that I forgot that I'd written with somebody in the band or, or uh, you know, an old roommate. Oh, I forgot I sat down with this person in 1983 and, and tried to write a song. So I'm glad I have all that. If I ever got to be really um, um, like well known, I would be, I would have an archive. I would have a cool archive. Oh, you mentioned going back to those, those old things. And it reminds me of something that Hemingway once said that he could never write about Paris when he was in Paris. He could never write about Pamplona he, when he was in Pamplona. He always needed distance from those uh, things. And so I guess, do you, do you write well with distance or is it better to be close to something and fresh? Well, Whether it's an emotion or a topic or anything like that. It depends. If I'm writing from a very emotional pace, place as, as like processing, <clears throat> which songwriting is definitely... Uh, a form of therapy for me and uh, if I have been hurt or betrayed or uh, feeling experiencing loss or or grief writing close to it is good it actually keep, takes me out of it a bit and puts me in a creative place and kind of helps me go you know I might even be sobbing as I'm writing but so like you know I wrote through my divorce I wrote songs to get me through my divorce um, so in that respect, I think when it's coming from a really raw emotional place, I, I would do it right in the spot. But when it comes to more, um, like, you know, with songs, I'm probably not going to write a song about a, a place so much. Yeah. So I wouldn't use the distance thing, but, um, for my songs a, a lot lately, I'm really interested in conveying themes and messages uh the ex you know i'm i'm almost 62 i have life experience i've overcome a lot you know anybody that reads my book that ends at 30 and there was still 
another 30 years of incredible yeah, right. growth and experiences and um, uh, bad stuff, great stuff. So that I have a, a pretty extensive uh, life of experience to draw from. And um, so my songs, I, I tend to, you know, I'm not going to sit down and write the same song as I did when I was 20, you know. Um, would I write Vacation at 60? It's possible, you know. It's possible that I could go on a vacation. and But would I have a fling at 60? I doubt it. You know, would I meet someone and fall in love? It's possible. Yeah. So, yeah, I could write Vacation, but it would be different, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. But that song was written, you know, right after it happened. And it's, I believe, one of the reasons it has a resonance and a longevity and that classic feeling is because I think, I think it is really, it's real. It's from the heart. It's not like I'm making something up and like imagining yeah. it. It was real. You know, since that, since March, I've been doing so many of these interviews. And most songwriters have told me that it's been difficult for them to write. And it reminds me of um, the theater critic for the Washington Post, Peter Marks, wrote this article a couple of weeks ago. And he talked about how... King Lear, uh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the plague and how he's expecting this incredible creative output from writers, playwrights, and just writers in general during the pandemic um, because maybe they, they have more time or they're home or just the emotions. And but the vast majority of songwriters have told me that it's been very difficult for them to write during this time because, you know, of, I guess, the block and the angst. Um, so is it easy and you know however however much you've been writing since march in general i guess has it been easy or is it easy in general to write during those really difficult periods like now well my book came out march 30th right as yeah. the pandemic started and i had to cancel a, a 25 city book tour that you know i was very very excited to do so i was more concerned with how i was going to keep any kind of momentum and bring attention. So I was in a very much a, for the first three months, really focused on promoting my book and doing as many interviews as I could. And I didn't write, I didn't write in that time, but uh, because that I just wanted to focus on getting people to know about my book. Um, but after that, I, I started, I, I signed up for, um, you know, I, I, I went back to school. So I'm in an environmental writing class and it's been amazing. It's, it's been life changing and it's been, uh, like I was saying before, really pushing me out of my comfort zone. And, uh, I'm writing a story based in the future now, and I've never done anything like that. And I don't know if I'm good at it, but the, the important thing is that I'm trying and that, you know, I'm learning what I'm learning, like, okay, how do I, how would I start? How would I balance, you know, summary and scene and something in third person based in the, I mean, I've never written anything like that. I have yeah. written some short stories, but they're always, um, from my point of view, even though I'm, it's not a, autobiographical, you know, I, I, I'll do it from first person. So I'm learning everything I do and I do want to write more. I want to be I don't want to be a one book wonder. I don't want to just write one memoir. I, I want my goal at the beginning of deciding to start trying to publish was um, to be a literary writer, but I didn't, I felt like why would anybody, you know, I, I didn't have that, um, that foundation laid, but a memoir kind of opens the door because people that read my memoir, the, they see that it's, it is have the, the potential that it's written in a literary way. It's not just, uh, it's not like a journal. It's not a hit piece. It's not a, you know, uh, dig the dirt or whatever. It's behind the, I forget all the words. It's not, there's, it's, it's a, a coming of age literary memoir that yeah. happens to have rock and roll in it. So I felt like that opened the door. So I, I'm really interested in doing more of that. I have not but, uh, you know, I have not had problems writing, no. But writing uh, the soundtrack to my book was was just a, a phenomenal experience. And um, and it really gave me, like, pretty much, there's, I, I have, I have a way to go forward as a writer that really excites me, you know. At my age, and with the Go-Go's very inactive, and with the my band in Austin, 
you know, not really being the kind of band that's going to work. We're, we're not all like 23 years old working, get to the top of the charts or get on tour. We all have really full lives and businesses and families and pets and homes to keep up and all that. So that's not the kind, it's more it's just like we're musicians, we're good musicians, let's go play, we write good songs. So, and I don't want to be a solo artist. So what I'm getting to is that the Go-Go's don't work hardly. The Blue Bonnets are, are fun, but is it going to be a career? I don't think so. I really don't want to be a solo artist. So what am I going to do? What excites me is this, is what I did, is writing prose, writing music that accompanies the prose. It excites me because, like I said, not every writer can do that. Not every yeah. writer can write a book or write a collection of short stories and then go in and mine it and make music that accompanies it, that expands on it, that is obviously linked to it, but isn't just like a, a, a soundtrack with somebody reading over it. I mean, it's, right. it's music that is that is um, linked inextricably to the, the the words. Let's talk about that ritual then, because I'm, I'm fascinated by the rituals of writers. You know, I, like I said, I read the Paris Review and I'm always interested in environment, ideal environment. So, you know, pick your, either talk about your book, you know, the writing process strictly, um, or songwriting, it's up to you and or. Um, what's your ideal writing environment, time of day, place things you have to have with you to get your best writing done i guess I mean, let's talk about the memoir first i mean were you going for pages a day uh time a day how do you what goals did you set along the way as you know during that writing process what was that ritual like for you well i'm i'm a big uh i'm, in, I'm into research I, I like to gather some information it kind of helps get me in the space of what i'm doing it's like okay a project is about to happen and i like to kind of gather an amount of information. So I did research a little bit, you know, I read, I read uh, Mary Carr's book on writing memoir. Um, I read some other things from, you know, what writers do. And what I mainly, the main thing I took from that was to create a space where you like to write. So I don't live in this house any longer. I moved two years ago, but when I started my book, I, I looked around at my house and I thought, where do I like to be the most? And there was a, a little area off of the kitchen that had a breakfast table and it was kind of an open floor plan. So there was the living room, there was a bathroom, there was a kitchen, there was the front door. And I realized where I really liked to be was that breakfast area. So I got rid of the table. I sold it and I put my, I put a desk in there and I set up a computer and that's where I really enjoyed writing my book. Um, I was still, when I moved, I was still um, uh, not done with the book. So I did the same thing in my new house. I found a little area where it's supposed to be like a breakfast nook and I put my desk in there and I could see out into the backyard. So I, for me, finding that place. And I, I just like being, I like being where the action was. I like being where I could make coffee or get a drink or go to the bathroom or answer the door, you know, just like where I wasn't running from some other place. So I didn't sequester off in an office or, or go off to a coffee shop or anything like that. I liked being home and I liked having that devoted place to do it. I didn't like, I don't like typing on my laptop at all. I like typing on a desktop. Um, so I, I needed a desk and I needed a space. So that was cool. Um, another thing I read was, you know, set aside this time, this amount of time. And that's just, that's just not how I am. I mean, if I sign up for exercise class, I'm, I'm throwing my money away because I, I, I just don't live that structure of a life. I might, sometimes I'm a night owl and I might be up till three or, you know, three in the morning writing or, or, or doing something. So if I have this structure thing, I don't know if I'm going to wake up at eight, seven, I might wake up at seven and go back to sleep at nine. Um, so um, I didn't have, that didn't work for me. So I became very open about, I like to think of it as in incremental writing. And I learned it as a songwriter, as a, and I, as a songwriter, some especially if I got stuck and I got stuck, I get stuck a lot in songs because 
I'm kind of, I'm a perfectionist. And if I write a great line and the two lines after that don't measure up, I can't go on. It has to, mm. it has to measure up. Otherwise I feel like I'm not honoring the, what was good about that. And again, this is all to my own standard. I don't, I don't care what anybody else thinks. It's what I think. So I have learned as a songwriter that just one line, just sit down and get one line get that you're happy with or get one, if this one chord change is bothering me, sit down and get that chord change or that transition right. Or if you don't like the way the bridge is flying, just one little part, just make a little bit of progress. So using that as a, as a prose writer, uh, writing a book was really helpful. And sometimes I would look at you know my watch and I'd go oh okay uh, I don't have to do anything for 20 minutes I'm gonna sit and I would sit down my document was already open and I would work for 20 minutes sometime now when I got closer to deadline I would work for hours on stretch but it wasn't a set thing um, so I think the process you have to do it to find process you have to do it to find the process and it was one of the best learning experiences I've had now I feel like when I write a next book, I won't have to do all that again. But other writers have said, oh, no, each book, you, you have to find the process again. It's, it's like, so I don't know if that's true or not, but I struggled for months with perfectionism. That's that perfectionism that can work OK with a song because a song is it's three minutes long and it has a few verses and a chorus and a bridge. You know, you have one page maybe so you can kind of afford to be it but with a freaking book i mean i sat down i think i spent six months writing three chapters over and over and revising wow. them and just and after about six months i was just like this is not going to work you know I, i'm never i'm never going to write this book if this is the way i'm going to do it so i i trained myself and i learned how to just i call it spewing and I that getting out of that perfectionism and just allowing myself to just t even if there's typos, even if it's dumb, even if I'm repeating the same line because it's just in my head and I'm just I'll just type the same line three times, just get a page. And then I started doing what you referred to before um, and aiming for pages. So sometimes I'd be like, OK, I just want three pages of just unfiltered unjudging, uncritiqued, unperfectionism writing. And that was a huge breakthrough because then I could go back anytime, whether I felt like writing or not, and look at it and start shaping it and go, oh, this is pretty good. And it, I just had something. I'm a good reviser. I'm a good editor. You know, another thing I took from songwriting into the writing process of a book was that you know, I have a lot of experience, decades of experience of, um, not a, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I have a lot of experience uh, in trusting my judgment as to what stays in and what goes out. I'm, I just trust myself. That I'm a good musician and I'm a good songwriter. And that means I trust myself. I trust that I know, no, that's got to go. That's not serving anything. That's too much. You know, less is more. So I knew I trusted my judgment and I could take that into. So when I would edit the slop, the spewing pages, it was really easy to go. This stays, this goes, this stays, this goes and shape it and, and revise. And that's how I started getting through the book. So that was the first thing. And it's the three P's as any writer knows about. So I dealt with perfectionism. That was part of my process. The next one was procrastination. And I was a huge procrastinator. I mean, I would sit down, documents ready to go, and then I'd be like, that pot out on the patio, it's got a crack in it, and I better go fix that. You know, the pot has been sitting there with a crack in it for three years. But, you know, all of a sudden it's like I'm compelled to fix it and glue it together. Or, you know, I really should be doing laundry. I mean, my normal life is the laundry piles up and doing it. I have to do it all day long. I don't, so, oh, but all of a sudden I'm on top of everything. I'm washing the dishes. My house was really clean when I was a procrastinating writer because I would, like, it seemed like anything was infinitely less uh, daunting 
than that blank page. So I had to deal with the procrastinating. And the way I did that was the way I deal with a lot of things in my life is to take what I think is a flaw and turn it into something useful. So I thought if I was not going to sit down and actually write in general literature on that page, if I'm going to procrastinate, it's not going to be laundry or dishes or gluing pots. It's going to be research. So I would use the time and the research in very me inspired so it might be a uh, music research um, maybe i'll i'd go okay i'm going to put together a playlist of songs that okay i'm writing about because i wrote chronologically i thought okay i'm writing about 1973 i'm 14 years old let's make a playlist of all the songs that i was listening to that were in the air that were in the you know, on the radio that were music soundtracks and i would make that song uh, playlist and I did that for every year every year I wrote about I had I created a playlist that might be one procrastination uh, binge was just and but the, it was a tool then I had this incredible tool that would take me back and help me I might procrastinate with a I might research like making sure verifying my time frame like I think this happened this but I want to be sure and I would uh, remember like, okay, I think I remember, um, you know, I remember there was like school riots in 1972. We had race riots at my school. What? And I would go back and, and look at what was happening in the country to kind of really reinforce and verify and remind me about why that was happening. Or I remember like being obsessed with a, uh, you know, the mafia and Manson murders. And I would go back to that year. I'm like, oh, no wonder this was the year that The Godfather came out and that uh, Helter Skelter came out. And so I would like research and give myself context and um, kind of, it was, it was almost like sinking, you know, how you want to sink your character in a setting and a place. Yeah. It was kind of like sinking myself yeah. in a setting and, a, and in a place and in an era. And it, invariably ended up inspiring invariably i would be excited to start writing because i was in the place i was almost like i was my i was the character and maybe it wouldn't work as well if it wasn't memoir you know but for memoir yeah. it was super effective and, oh the third p is paralysis and i did have times of paralysis i had times where i would not write for weeks and it, I would get a little panicked, you know, I think I, this isn't going to happen. I don't, I mean, weeks, weeks would go yeah. by. And yet what I started seeing was that when I would sit down and it sometimes in, when a large stretch like that went by, I would think it's not going to happen and I would feel paralyzed. But invariably when I did sit down and write something, it would be really good. And I would look at it and go, if I had done this a week ago, it wouldn't have been this. Maybe you know, it would. I would have yeah. written something else, and there's no way of knowing what it would have been. But I don't think it would have been this. So I started getting comfortable with that. Even as long That's as I could honestly say, you know, okay, this has been too long. This has been too long. Yeah. I've got yeah. to do something. But uh, I started not like beating myself over or being afraid that I was paralyzed for life. And at one point. I took eight months off. I didn't write for eight months. Wow. And that was because my dad was, my dad came back into my life. Uh, a big part of my book was my relationship, non-relationship with my dad. And sure. I had this opportunity to know him and help him navigate a difficult surgery that ultimately ended up to him not living, but it was an eight month process. And during that whole time, we, we established a, a very close relationship. So in a way it was informing the writing, um, but I was really worried at the end of that, like, how am I gonna go back to this book, you know? And, yeah. and uh, I, I considered not, not finishing. That I really did. And then the editor at University of Texas Press contacted me because they didn't want to read anything on the way, but the editor just wanted a finished draft. Yeah. And, you know, he, he sent me an email. He said, I know this happened with your dad and this and that, but you're X amount of time overdue 
for your deadline and you know are you, when can you get us something and I was just like I had to like right then decide am I going to do it and I said okay and I had three months and I said I will have a draft to you by January yeah do you you talk about that place where you like to write and I think a lot about for me it's confidence there are certain places in the house that I tend to write better than others and it's confidence I mean it's where the mojo is right do you feel like they're you know and whether that's superstition or not I don't know but I do feel like there are certain places where the writing happens others where it doesn't um and it sounds like that's the way it was with you like you had that certain place where for whatever reason it just tended to happen right yeah, and it's been interesting in the pandemic because my daughter is remote learning and she's a high school senior. So she she's taking a lot of AP classes and she really she needs that space yeah. to, to excel in school and to deal with a whole new way of being a student. So I kind of gave her the desk in the kitchen, which is my place, and I've tried to write more on my laptop and it is affecting me. I don't like seeing the small, not the whole document. Um, this is my little studio and I really should start trying to write in here because I, I need I need to do that. And I, I think just talking with you has made me realize that while she's in school uh, for the rest of this year, that I need to make this not just my music room, but where I can write too. Yeah, I do. I feel like there are certain places that if I'm there, it's going to happen. And I actually write in one room and revise in another because I oh, try really? to get as yeah, I try to get as far away from the writing process as I can because the closer I am to the writing process, I'm more likely to miss stuff. So I write in one room and always revise in the other. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, and I and I think these little these rituals it's, it doesn't take long. I mean, I'm a ritualistic person to begin with. You know, I will you know, eat the same protein bar for breakfast for like, you know, six weeks and then go, I'm yeah. sick of this. And then I'll do something else. I mean, I'm really ritualistic. I don't know if it's part of my being a, a, an addict or alcoholic. I don't know if it's just my brain f goes into these weird grooves. But uh, yeah, so I could see that happening. I, I don't do that, but I could see it doing. If I did it a few times, it would be how I did it. Do you have revision tricks? I'm curious. I mean, I, I do things like read out, you know, for my, when I write, read out loud, read backwards to catch grammatical errors, uh, you know, do, uh, you know, various things to kind of make the writing look different to me. Um, what is your revision? What tricks do you have in that revision process? Like when you're revising your prose? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think, I think just, I think I kind of revised as I, it's like when I record a song, I'm kind of mixing as I go. You know, I, I don't, I try to make sure I'm got the, the sound I want as I go. And, you know, I'm kind of doing things because I don't, I, I want to be halfway done when I finish, you know, or more than halfway done. So I, I kind of revise as I go. It was finding that sweet place between perfectionism and, and then kind of, also not letting something that I know isn't working very well. Now, if it's interrupting a flow, I'll sit with it. If I'm in a flow, which is, you know, I wish I could say that's where I was most of the time, but it's it's just not, you know, most of the time I'm just, you know, getting stuff on the page. Um, yeah. But every now and then I would hit a flow where it was just coming out. And in that case, I wouldn't self edit or self revise as I went. Um, but generally I would, before writing, I would sit down and read, I would go back from what I'd written before just to kind of gather the context to see the flow. The flow was really important to me. Um, and I would just kind of read and did, did something seem awkward and I would just kind of fix it on, you know, as I went and I did do some reading out loud. I did some reading, not a lot, but I did some like that. And I, I found it a helpful thing to do. Um, I always end with this. I mean, I, I find that songwriters are voracious readers and, and, you know, since you're writing different genres as well, um, who are, who you, who do you like to read? Who are you reading now? Um, and who are some of your favorite authors? Well, I think one of the reasons when I wanted to be a writer, I think one of the reasons 
I was afraid to be a writer and, and it led me to memoir, which is only this was that I, I had that, I had that perfectionist mindset and I thought there's no way am I going to be as good as this or that or this person or that. And if I'm not going to be as good as that, I don't want to do it. And yet with a memoir, it was like nobody could write that book as well as me. Nobody. That, yeah. that, that was my story. So it gave me a lot of confidence. So that, that was really cool. I would almost tell, if I was a, a professor, I would almost say, go write 50 pages of memoir that's only you, tell st stuff that only you can tell. Because yeah. that gave me yeah. a lot of uh, faith in my voice. Um, but so I was a big fan up until probably the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, mostly of, of classic literature. So I'm like, that's my, my standard is like, you know, Thomas Mann and Somerset Mom and, you know, just uh, Dostoevsky. And I mean, I just love, I, I just loved classic literature. I didn't want to live my life without having read the classics, you know? And so that takes a long time. There's a lot of really good books. So I was really, that was where I was as a reader for m most of my life. And then I started thinking, well, I, I really should read more contemporary. And, and that doesn't mean like I didn't read a bestseller now and then or a, an escape book. I, I, you know, I've enjoyed um, a lot of kind of bestseller books too. Uh, um, God, there, of course, I'm going blank. If I just went to my bookshelf, I could start rattling off a bunch. But um, I I think another thing that got me interested in memoir was some of the really good memoirs that I read, which I loved, um, you know, Mary Carr, who's a, you know, did a series of memoirs. Yeah. I loved, um, I was in inspired by Augustine Burroughs books uh, because I thought, okay, I think my life could be a couple of, I don't know if I could do six or he's written, he's really mined that life a lot, but I, I don't think I could write six books about my life, but I think I have another book about my life in me. Um, I loved uh, Tara Westover, Educated, Cheryl Strayed, Wild, oh, yeah. uh, 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 Glass Castle. I forgot. I don't remember the author's name. Uh, I was. I started checking out a lot of um, writers from a different point of view. That uh, I guess I'll just say, you know, from different uh, ethnic groups. Because yeah. I wanted to be inspired by other experiences, so uh, Juno Diaz and um, Roxanne Gay and uh, Ta Ta Tanahisi Coates, and just starting to, I started expanding a lot, and uh, I've really been enjoying getting into uh, the viewpoint and the life experience that's away from my own. Yeah, I will say for my book, the two biggest inspirations were Chronicles by Bob Dylan and Just Kids by Patti Smith. Those were my two biggest inspirations. That's what I, that was the quality I aimed for. I kept a copy of each on my desk, right by my computer, just to kind of remind me what I was shooting for all the time. Um, Dylan's book in particular, when I read that, made me go back to the beginning and start revising not because of the style of his writing, but because of what particularly I took from it was his the way he made every incidental person that came on the page, every character came to life in the most interesting way with a couple of sentences. And I was just completely enamored with how he did that. And so I thought, anybody I introduce, how how can I bring what I what he did and figure out how can I get a sense of this person on the page in a couple of sentences and they don't have to ever come back they don't have to be a, a main character but you know you know it could just be like you know this is the type of person that you know if if they were on a pirate ship and they walked the plank you know that that they would turn around and you know I, I don't know just just some kind of action uh i'm not good off the on the fly obviously but just kind of like getting an essence of a person that's away from like, oh, they were six feet tall and had short, spiky hair and, you know, walked this way. I just, I was really enamored of that. So.